Carol, look, my point is, why do we keep talking about case numbers? Isn't it irrelevant? Shouldn't we be talking about hospitalizations and deaths? We don't talk about flu case numbers on a daily basis. You're right, Dan. Hospital numbers have gone up. The trouble with hospital numbers, there's a six day delay. So the ones we've got are from last week's Tuesday. And there were 915 people admitted to hospital, which again is the highest number for several weeks now. Now, my feeling is that no point panicking at this stage. It, there's nothing different. It's just we've all come out. We're all doing things. We're mixing. We're, we're you know, being uh, you know much more normal than we were even six months ago, and therefore the numbers are going to go up. The number of people going to hospital is trivial compared with what it was. And of course, the mortality, the number of people dying of COVID is very low. And is still, those that die on the whole are very old. They're beyond the normal life expectancy. So, you know, it, there's no point panicking at this point. No, no point. And, and the thing is, Carol, can't we also just have a realistic conversation about the fact that we know going into winter cases will surge at certain points because we've had years where the NHS is close to overwhelmed because of flu cases too. This isn't completely out of the ordinary. Absolutely. No, I was a medical student a long time ago, and I remember my first ward when I was first a medical student at Central Middlesex Hospital in West London. And the, it was a pandemic going. All operations were cancelled. It was a flu pandemic. And this was the normal. We called it winter pressures. And we've seen it every winter. Now I'm a consultant. I've seen it all the way through. Every winter, activity grinds to a halt because you just don't have the capacity in the NHS to deal with it. And that's the key problem. Other countries have much more capacity than we do to deal with elderly people, and we're all living a lot longer than we used to, elderly people getting all sorts of chest problems in winter, caused primarily by viruses, not just coronavirus, but all sorts of other viruses, and they're going to get them this winter. They're going to get flu, they're going to get upper respiratory viruses, they're going to get secondary pneumonia. This is going to be the problem. And the other problem, Dan, that we have now in the last decade is that there's very poor social care for many people. There's nowhere for them to go out of hospital. So they sit there in hospital. We call them bed blockers. That's a pejorative, of course, to call them. It's not their fault they're bed blockers. They have nowhere to go. They can't go back to a care home. Families don't want to see them again. And we're sort of stuck in the NHS with everybody like this. So better solutions for a whole review of how we deal with the elderly, ill people that are in society. Now, Carol, it's emerged from the NHS's own data that just half, just half of GP appointments in England in July were with a qualified doctor. The rest were carried out by nurses, pharmacy assistants and even acupuncturists. Now, despite this, the doctor's body, the BMA, is fighting back. Their head, Chand Nag Paul, has actually called it harassment and discrimination to try and get GPs back to face-to-face -face work. But surely, Carol, our GPs have had a year and a half without face-to-face -face appointments. They need to get back to work. How is this harassment? You know, you're quite right. It is, it is. They need to get back to work. We need to do something to... General practice has basically gone down the pan over the last 20 years. It started under the Blair government when they allowed the GPs to stop at five o'clock and they provide on-call services. Then NHS Direct, which was the forerunner of NHS 111, the, the, the telephone advisory service, came into being. And so the GPs could stop. Now, it's very difficult being a GP, and I don't want to detract from what they do and it's essential work but they have to get back to seeing people if you've got new symptoms you've got to be seen you've got to look at people in the eyes you've got to feel them you've got to examine them and you know time and time again we're going to see errors if we don't get back to the culture we're never going to get back to the culture where you'll know your doctor he'll know you uh you know, you'll meet him maybe in a bar for a drink and that sort of thing that's never going to come back the, the Dr. Cameron and Dr. Finlay, the, you wouldn't remember because you're too young, Dan, and you were brought up in New Zealand. But these guys were heroes on the, on, on the television screen of Scottish general practice in Tannock Bray. Uh, but they've gone. They've ridden into history. And what we've got now is a piecemeal service. 
people working sessions, working part time, but we still can get back. And I think Sajid Javid is, is completely correct. He's got to insist that at least new, new patients with new symptoms should be seen in person before they're put onto some algorithm to follow them on the telephone.